Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show, where today we examine controversial decisions of the UK government in dealing with the COVID pandemic. Vaccine policy is recommended by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, the JCVI. And in surprise and heavily caveated advice last week, the committee recommends a deferral of consideration of offering COVID vaccines to secondary school children. Should the government wish to consider vaccination of children and young adults aged less than 18 years with the primary aim of reducing the SARS-CoV-2 infection rate, asymptomatic and symptomatic cases, irrespective of other direct or indirect benefits as discussed above, the known benefits from vaccination are likely to be limited. In this instance, JCVI favours deferral of a universal offer of vaccination until more data have accrued, including a clearer understanding of the impact of COVID-19 in the UK within the context of a successful adult vaccination programme. However, many scientists disagree, and even more strikingly, so does most international advice in high vaccinated countries, including the policymakers in America, Germany, New Zealand and the Netherlands. The position is particularly pressing in Scotland, where the schools go back in a mere three weeks and where recent comparisons between the Scottish and English rates of infection strongly suggest that schools have been the key vector of transmission of the virus. Scotland's rate of COVID transmission was higher than England until the Scottish schools went off on holiday and then was quickly overtaken by the English rate, where the schools were still in session. In today's show, we talk to two key experts from north and south of the border about the government's decision-making on vaccination. Dr Chris Smith, the top Cambridge virologist, has become a household name during the pandemic while Professor Sir Harry Burns, formerly the Chief Medical Officer for Scotland, is President of the British Medical Association. But first, to your tweets, emails and messages in response to our recent shows featuring Scottish authors Andrew Neil MacLeod and Murray Armstrong and New Zealand epidemiologist Professor Michael Baker and Dr Bharat Pinkania of Exeter University. First, in relation to our authors, Dalrymple says, really interesting show, many thanks to all contributors. Claire Conlon says, fabulous interview with Andrew Neil McLeod. I am definitely buying his book and I wish him all the best with Netflix. Love this comment to Alex at the end. Arthur McMillan says, insofar as the Enlightenment, Scots were fundamental in the formation of American politics. One must ask, with the benefit of hindsight, how did that pan out? Arthur goes on to say, all history should be available in schools to everyone interested about everything, whether you like it or no. And finally, on our authors, Anita with a special message to Andrew's wife says, Amber, love it. Your husband was great. And so say all of us. Then moving on to our show on COVID and vaccinations, Gordon McKenzie says, when I was in school many years ago, we got vaccinated at school. I remember long lines of kids getting jabs one by one. There was no problem with the strategy back then. Would it be a problem now? Linda says, great topic, Alex, for bringing up the sheer incompetence of Boris Johnson. Anissa says, well, I, for one, will be continuing to wear my mask. And finally, Kevin says, we must, Anissa, it is our only protection. Now, Dr Chris Smith of the Naked Scientist platform has become a household name during the pandemic. No one better explains the behaviour of this coronavirus. Dr Chris Smith, welcome back to the Alex Salmon Show. Pleasure. Now, Chris Smith, we have this situation where high vaccinated countries like Israel and America are now vaccinating school children, certainly secondary school children, but the UK advice is not. How do we explain this? Well, we've waited a long time for the JCVI, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, to pronounce their verdict on this. And many of us suspected they probably would say, because our regulator, the MHRA, had endorsed and pronounced safe the use of vaccines in 12 to 16 year olds. And we have other major jurisdictions like the US, other European countries like France and other countries elsewhere in the world, like Israel, as you say, that have gone down the path of saying these vaccines are safe and we're going to use them and they are indeed using them in young people. So we assume that we would probably follow suit. And the argument in favour of doing that is that if you've got a, a population and you want to vaccinate as many people as possible, this will translate into a reduction in spread of the virus, especially in the new school year, in the autumn, when we know that everything becomes much more common in the autumn because that's when seasonal infections tend to surge. 
and there will be knock-on repercussions of that. The JCVI, on the other hand, have said they're not going to support that course of action, and they cite as, as one reason for that in their cost-benefit analysis the low risk of some side effects. Out of nearly 200 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine, which has been approved for this age group being given, and the Moderna vaccine, which works the same way, there's a couple of hundred cases of a myocarditis, an inflammation in the heart. Well, that puts the frequency of that side effect at about one in a million. That, though, is about the same as the risk of you getting a severe dose of coronavirus if you're that age. So you can see why there's a tension for them. They're protecting young people from something with a risk profile that's sort of the same frequency as the side effects of the vaccine. But the wider protection isn't being taken into account. So I think it's a difficult decision. I can see why they've made it, but I would personally have supported encouraging anyone who's 12 and up getting a jab because I think it will contribute to our ability long term to control the virus. So you can see why Professor Adam Finn of the JCVI would say that uh, the risk to children is vanishingly small, but it's less easy to explain about the risk of infectivity across the population, given that the JCVI is recommending that JAGs be given to, to children who have a vulnerable adult in their household. How do we explain that contradiction? Well, speaking to the BBC on Saturday, Adam Finn was, was asked about the rationale behind doing this, and, and he made precisely the point that, um, as the statistics show, you're about as likely to be hit by lightning as you are to get a severe dose of COVID if you're a child. Children also tend to spread coronavirus a bit less well, but not zero, than older people, and they do not suffer from severe side effects of coronavirus. But what they could do is, of course, take the infection home and introduce it through the household unit to other more vulnerable people. And at the same time, remember that we have seen uh, encouragement of use of the vaccines in vulnerable children. So we are going to be vaccinating children who are judged to be particularly vulnerable. We're just not vaccinating children en masse at the moment. But in the last few weeks, haven't we seen an indication that the schools are a vector of infection? I mean, the Scottish uh, infective, infectivity rate was higher than England's. The Scottish schools, where the holidays are earlier in England, go out uh, three or four weeks ago. Uh, and suddenly the Scottish rate it drops below England. Has there been any study to look at the comparison between Scottish and English schools uh, to establish whether that is true? I'm not sure whether anyone's looked specifically at whether there is a relationship between the school year in Scotland versus in England and cases of coronavirus. But certainly we have looked for decades, in, pre in previous decades, at the issue of whether the school year drives surges in seasonal infections, and it absolutely does. I mean, there's a really good body of research that shows that children going to school, mixing at school, it's a giant crucible for infections. We know that the school year is a potent driver, and that is actually why the UK government have said, well, we're going to have Freedom Day when we're going to have Freedom Day, because it will overlap strongly with when schools are off. Mm. And that would be supported by the, the fact that last week a, a million uh, school children in England were off, were pinged off, were self-isolating because of classmates uh, or teachers who, who'd been uh, identified with coronavirus. I mean, if the schools weren't a vector of infection, why were a, a million children back at home last week? Well, I think a million workers are also back at home this week, aren't they? And we've got uh, companies like Felix Doe Docks uh, saying, organisations like Felix Doe Docks saying that they're almost on the cusp of not being able to operate. We've got certain other operators that have said we're just going to have to shut up shop at the moment because we do not have enough staff to run our business safely or effectively. Uh, this is being dubbed the pingdemic. Now, as a virologist who <clears throat> understands the, the behaviour of viruses, and in particular this potent, highly infectious uh, new strain of coronavirus, what was your personal reaction when you, you saw these scenes of uh, revellers in nightclubs celebrating Freedom Day and, or, or going down the Thames in pleasure boats last week? I mean, how did, what did it sort of personal, when you looked at that, was you saying, what on earth is going on? Well, it's a pressure relief valve, isn't it? And this is telling us that there's a lot of pressure in the boiler. There's a considerable head of steam. And young people feel that they've been robbed not of one, but two summers almost now. And they're desperate to get back to some semblance of normality. That said, um, I, I hope that people will re remain responsible and accept that we're not out of the woods, as we keep being told by politicians. It hasn't gone away. We have got lots of cases. But what I find reassuring 
is that the cases are currently cropping up in younger people and chiefly in unvaccinated people. And that means that if we carry on the way we're going, which is to have a strong push towards vaccinating everybody, then we have a fair chance of actually really suppressing down numbers so that it remains manageable. We all accept that the virus is not going to go away. It will become endemic. It will continue to circulate. But what we need to do is to convert it from what could be a lethal infection for some into a fairly trivial infection for everyone. But is there a, an international precedent for, for a country with a partially vaccinated population uh, opening up restrictions into the, the teeth of a, a pandemic? Um, I don't think so, which is why we're being described as a unique experiment by a number of commentators. Even the WHO have said that this is uh, a dubious state of affairs, that if we don't use the advantages being handed to us at the present time, which is a very heavily vaccinated, albeit with some way to go, adult population, the summer, the end of the school year, people going away on holiday, so fewer people in the workplace, on public transport and so on, then we're, we're coinciding with a, a drop in pressure on the NHS anyway. This gives us a window of opportunity. If we don't move now and try this, then we are absolutely committed to not doing this until at least next spring. Often we've come to believe that, that, that virus behaviour, as they become more infectious, they become less potent uh, and less deadly. Is that still a hope and expectation of uh, this coronavirus, or alternatively, are we going to get ever more threatening and ever more potent deviant uh, strains of the virus? Well, the reason we've got a problem with this Delta variant is it's more infectious. It can surmount pre-existing immunity, and it can surmount pre-existing immunity conferred by vaccination. So you've got something that spreads better, and it gets through previous pre-existing defences, which means that if you're a vulnerable person, it doesn't have to be a nastier virus. It's just the mere fact that it's infected you that means if you get lots of infections, you'll still get people who have consequences of those infections at a big level, at least until you get enough people who are sufficiently immune in the population that they become less vulnerable to that effect. So really, uh, we don't know at the moment. And you never say never in medicine because if you do, you will be caught out. So Dr Smith, one thing people are referring to, because of the conditions of social restrictions and lockdowns, other viruses, not just coronavirus, have, have obviously been suppressed. Can, can we now expect a, an upsurge of some of our more familiar viruses to also threaten us this coming autumn and winter? We're already seeing that happening, and we have already seen that happen in some other countries. The, the usual seasonal suspects, viruses like RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, Viruses like para-influenza, para-flu, they're already causing a problem in some places and in significant amounts, and there are several reasons for that. One, they're coming back because people are mixing more, and these viruses transmit through close personal contact, so you tend to see more cases as you ease lockdowns and, and their endemic infections. The other worry is that uh, with time of not being exposed to these things, people will have lost some of their immunity to them, certainly among older people. And there is therefore a theoretical risk that because of that slippage in immune response, some of them may come back and produce more profound, more significant illness, particularly this winter. And people are particularly concerned about the flu, either this year or in forthcoming years, because A, flu's completely gone off our radar. We have seen so few cases that it's much harder to track how the virus is changing, what it's doing, what it's uh, actually going to rematerialize as, and therefore whether the vaccines are going to be effective against it is more of an unknown, and at the same time people are losing their immunity. So therefore there is potentially the, the threat of a big flu season, which is why governments in many, many countries are really pushing flu vaccination, and they've brought down the age at which some, in some countries that people are being vaccinated against the flu as a safeguard against that. Dr Chris Smith, thank you so much for joining me again on the Pleasure. Alex Salmon Show. Coming up after the break, Alex interviews Professor Sir Harry Burns. We'll see you then. Welcome back. Professor Sir Harry Burns is both the President of the British Medical Association and a world-leading public health expert. Harry, welcome back to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you. Pleasure. This advice from last week from the GCVI, this long-awaited advice saying don't vaccinate the, uh, the school kids. 
How do you explain that when countries like Israel, America, highly vaccinated countries are saying, vaccinate the school kids? What, what's going on? I'm not entirely clear uh, what the basis of the JCBI advice was. I know I've certainly heard some reports of younger kids in some of these countries um, be becoming ill. Now, whether or not it was the vaccine that made them ill, there was enough. My colleagues from abroad have said there was enough concern about, about it that they weren't entirely 100% uh, comfortable with vaccinating young, young children. If we could be sure of the safety, then obviously it would make a lot of sense to vaccinate them because school rooms, difficult to socially distance, difficult to ventilate in older buildings and so on, um, mask wearing maybe not so uh, good for younger children, it, it would be a hotbed for transmitting virus from one child to another and the child takes it back home and the parents then become infected or maybe the grandparents and so on. So it would be good to do it, but we should only do it when JCBI is absolutely sure of the safety of it because the last thing you want to do is to damage a child who is maybe at low risk of getting coronavirus anyway. But if the committee felt that the vaccine was unsafe for, for children, then why would they be advising it for, for children with certain conditions yeah. uh, and indeed for, for children wh where the adults at home uh, are, are particularly vulnerable to the virus? So why would be advising it for some children and not others if it was felt to be unsafe? I, I can only imagine it's a, it's a risk-benefit uh, choice that they're making. If the risk is greater, then, you know, the benefit is greater if they vaccinate it. I mean, at the moment, I, I think I, it may be that some of the anxiety is about the fact that children haven't been exposed to an awful lot of the vaccine and therefore they're not sure they can say with certainty that the risk is very small. So, you know, I think they're playing it safe. I haven't seen data on complications. I've just heard anecdotally about children who've had some uh, thrombotic complications and so on. Um, but it, they really have to get the data and sort that out. We'll have to get cracking because we're only three weeks away now from the Scottish schools going back in our timetable. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. Um, I think we may well know a bit more about what things are happening in the next few weeks. But in the absence of, of vaccinating, let's say the secondary, the school children and the teachers, uh, uh, still some, uh, is there any other measure that you know parents can take to make the, their children safer if they're, they're going to school into an unvaccinated environment? Well, things like regular testing of pupils and teachers and so on might work but that's you know that that's that's a hard um a hard policy to implement you don't know if people are testing properly lateral flow tests are um not entirely accurate and so on um i i think that the teachers need to be vaccinated the older pupils need to be vaccinated and we need to see what is happening to younger children and let JCBI decide about vaccinations lower down the age range. Um, I, I absolutely accept the fact that um, not vaccinating the kids is a hard decision, but I don't see any reason other than safety not to do it, to be honest. Um, you know, and somebody somewhere must be asking questions about the safety of it. And if JCBI is saying, don't do it yet, then they can't have answered the question. So masks, distancing, and these kind of things are, are the things that we have to rely on at the moment while we get the data on the, the, the safety of the vaccine for younger children.
But from a public health perspective, uh, I mean, over the last few weeks, I mean, I, I went to the England and Scotland game at Wembley two or three weeks ago, and there was 12,000 fans there. It was all, you had to be double tested before you, you got in. The whole thing was conducted with impeccable rigour. But two or three weeks later, there's 60,000 in Wembley for the, for the final. There's, there's 30,000 a day at the Open Golf. There's 140,000 at the Grand Prix. I mean, aren't these sort of things just asking for trouble? Correct. They absolutely are. Um, you know, a lot of these things, you're outside. And being outside is better than being inside, uh, particularly if it's sunny. The ultraviolet seems to have a, a depressing effect on the infectivity of the, the virus. But what is really worrying me is this uh, is reopening the, the nightclubs down in England. I mean, that's just daft. I could use a stronger word, but I won't. <laughs> From a public health perspective, when you, when you assess uh, what uh, your former colleagues have been doing with north and south of the border and the other countries of the United Kingdom, uh, how would you basically assess the performance of the, the government on public health? Is it, uh, is it uh, A minus or is it uh, somewhere near gamma? Um, <laughs> well, um, you might want to ask Dominic Cummings that as far as England is concerned. But um, you and I both know that professional advisors are there to advise politicians. And I was very fortunate during the flu pandemic because the professional politicians listened and did the right thing. And I think, by and large, that's what's happened this time in Scotland. I get the sense that the same thing is happening in Wales. And Northern Ireland, I'm not so sure about. I haven't heard too much about that yet. But there is a, a discomfort in my medical colleagues that... Uh, They've been working really, really hard for 18 months that the lifting of restrictions down there is going to lead to another surge and that the UK government hasn't actually listened to what they're being told by the medical profession particularly. And the other thing is that a lot of my medical colleagues are worried about what, what's happening to people with cancer and heart disease and so on, we need other treatment. If the beds are getting full again, then that will delay treatment for other things that are potentially curable or modifiable, and people are going to suffer. So suppressing this as much as we can, as soon as we can, is important. Um, I absolutely recognise the economic arguments and so on, but I've got absolutely no sympathy with the idea that we can open up nightclubs and all that kind of thing and let everyone run riot and spread the virus. That is damaging. And very finally, uh, Harry, the, are, are we going to see the re-emergence of uh, some of our familiar old enemies who've been suppressed by the lockdown, etc., the, 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 the flu and, uh, and a range of other viruses. And is that a concern to you? Or, alternatively, will the better public health habits that some of us have picked up and will continue with, will that help us in the long term against these more familiar foes? Well, last year, of course, we saw hardly any flu because the way in which you suppress flu is you wear masks and you socially distance and you wash your hands and so on. It's a good way of dealing with viruses generally. So, I mean, I, it wouldn't surprise me if coronavirus became the new flu. Um, if enough people get vaccinated, the severity of coronavirus will be less, we hope. And in the 1918 flu pandemic, literally hundreds of millions of people all around the world died of flu, and flu began to produce different subtypes which were less serious and so on, and that's what we live with every winter. And it might be that coronavirus falls into the same pattern. We get vaccinated, therefore it becomes less severe, and every year we get a booster shot uh, dependent on the strain of coronavirus that's circulating, and we have it with our flu vaccine, and that's what's been planned for this year, and that's absolutely correct. Well, so Harry Burns, on that 
fairly optimistic uh, look at the future, which we all hope will come to pass. Thank you very much indeed for, for joining me once again on the Alex Salmon Show. Pleasure. To vaccinate or not to vaccinate older school children? That is the question. The JCVI decision to defer a decision has provoked consternation among some experts. In terms of vaccine safety, they point to the strong advice from other regulatory authorities. In terms of public health, they point to the evidence of schools as a key vector of infection and the unknown impact of long COVID amongst children, even following a mild initial infection. Most disturbing is the thought that Scottish schools are returning within weeks, around one month before their English counterparts. That means children will be returning to a largely unvaccinated environment, which in turn suggests higher rates of infection in the population and continued disruption of the school timetable. Now, none of these are easy decisions to make, but to govern is to choose. Deferral of a decision until after the Scottish secondary schools are back seems the worst of all options. A non-decision, a cop-out, perhaps at the expense of children and their families. But for now, from Alex, myself and all at the show, it's goodbye, stay safe, and we hope to see you all again next week. <laughs>